I'd like to call to order this committee the whole meeting of the Town of Sogging Shores and then extend a welcome to everyone in the chambers this evening. The first order of business is a declaration of pecuniary interest. And I'll remind every man member of your responsibility to do so, and you can do so now or when it arises on the agenda. Nothing then this evening. Uh, any, you know, any additions, deletions, or amendments? And I, we have none before me. So this evening we have four deputations, and the first one is Brad Scott and Pierre Denini. They're board members from the chamber, and they're here about the 2015 Pumpkin Fest. Welcome, Brad and Pierre. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Smith, Council Members. October 3rd and 4th is just a little more than a month away, and the Pumpkin Fest staff and community are gearing up for another fantastic community event for the 29th year. We're here tonight to thank you for your continued support and to update you on Pumpkin Fest 2015. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Brad Scott, current chair of Port Elgin Pumpkin Fest, and I'm proud to say it's my 21st year with the event. Alongside me is Pierre Danini, one of our Chamber Board representatives and local business owner of the Queen's Bar and Grill. Also with us tonight are staff and several members of my committee of Board of Directors. Uh, I have Earl Anderson, uh, Vice Chair in the back, Mike Gallagher, Chairperson of the Car Show Committee, uh, Mandy Seabock, Corby Leach, Connie Barker, and uh, Ron Knight. So tonight we thank you for allowing us the time to present our delegation and are pleased to announce some exciting new attractions for 2015. We'll also we will also confirm some of our tried, tested, and true events. Some of our new attractions this year include Little Tracks Petting Zoo, proudly presented by Boston Pizza. This attraction features up to 30 farm animals, including donkeys, goats, and chinchillas. This attraction will be located in front of our Bruce Power Growers Tent. Also down in this area, we're making our new Aunt Mabel straw, straw bale maze bigger and better. Parrots can sit and in this area we're making and watch their children make their way through our labyrinth. You can also enjoy various carving demonstrations, pumpkin and the like throughout the festival. <clears throat> Joining us both on site and on stage will be, the t will be Tim the Puppet Tamer presenting the Petite Chef. Rooted in the traditions of clown, circus and improvisation, the Puppet Tamer Show brings the best in live theatre to life. In regards to our regular attractions, of course the Bruce Power International Way Off Tent will be returning and no matter the difficulties our growers face year after year, we always anticipate the possibility of great giants. 2015 marks the 25th anniversary of OLG's Cinderella's Carriage Classic Car Show. We still remain one of Ontario's largest two-day outdoor car shows and within the perimeter of the show, you can also find the Motorcycle Show and the Corvette Corral. Our car show volunteers will be led by a new chairman this year, Mike Gallagher as our previous chair, Earl Anderson, has taken on the role of vice chair for the festival. We thank them both for their commitment to our event. Bruce Telecom will be back with their Harvest Starships competition and family entertainment stage. We have also invited local establishments to run a karaoke competition for the month of September that will send their best performer to our stage Saturday afternoon. You can also catch a ventriloquist show from the Petit Chef on both Saturday and Sunday amongst music and dance from our talented local entertainers such as Midtown Cross, Lance Eckensweiler and the Celtic Dancers. The OPG Environment Tent will once again feature Elephant Thoughts, offering experiences of weightlessness with the, human, the amazing human gyroscope and new this year will be their Dino Dig exhibit. This large and interactive display will give everyone the chance to be a paleontologist for a day. Friday night, we will see the return of the Pumpkin Crawl, sponsored by Grey Boos Airbus in Port Elgin and Southampton. Licensed establishments will offer live entertainment to help kick off Pumpkin Fest weekend, and patrons can purchase wristbands at all participating venues. Wristbands are required to ride the shuttle bus, which will run a continuous circuit to provide safe transportation. Thanks again to the Colonial Motel and Antiques and the Port Elgin Rotary Club. We are, happy announce, we are happy to announce this year's quilt entitled Pumpkin Fest Missouri Star and was hand quilted by Bill and Sybil Henderson. It is currently on display in the Sunrise Cafe located in the motel. For anyone who is looking to take on a more, more active involvement and a chance to win, you may get out your camera and submit an entry to our photography contest or enter Reed's Heritage Homes Baking Contest which will be moving back to the way off tent this year. We will be asking all Soggy Shores residents to help us with alleviating traffic congestion by ensuring that their vehicles are not left downtown Port Elgin. 
overnight or in any of the advertised parking areas as well as the municipal lots that we use for our car shows, vendors, or the Corvette Corral. An official request will be made through an article in the official program produced by the Shoreline Beacon as well as announced on our website and through our social media outlets, Facebook and Twitter. I draw your attention to your packages now. In them you will find a package of pumpkin seeds to practice for celebrity seeds bidding. You can go up against myself, Mayor Mike and some of the other fine folks who have joined me on stage before to see who can win this year. Uh, Please contact Corby at, uh, at our office for complimentary wristbands and parking passes should you need them. We are, off, we are once again offering our family pass to our residents for $25, available at our office until September 25th. This is a $5 savings and our way of saying thank you to our community for their support over the years. The municipality of Saugeen Shores has been bumped up this year from a giant sponsor to a gold for all of their generous in-kind support to Port Elgin Pumpkin Fest. Each of the municipal departments plays a very important role in our success, and we really couldn't do it without the help of the community. We really appreciate the willingness of municipal staff to assist us with our requests, sometimes on very short notice. Thank you for your time this evening, and we're very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Brad. Any questions for Brad or Pierre? Mike, I've actually got a couple. Sure, of those. go ahead. Yep. That's okay. Um, I'm Brad quite ably uh, spoke to the today this year's festival and, and all it has to offer and um, I'm, I'm here actually in a slightly different role um, I'm on the pumpkin fest board I'm on the Chamber of Commerce board I'm also a business owner in town um, I'm speaking here tonight on behalf of the future I think of pumpkin fest and and um, my prediction is this won't be the first time I speak before this body regarding this topic um, Pumpkin Fest is um, it almost happened, um, grew to a size that uh, I think took some people by surprise, and, and it has been great for our community. Um, I think we've come to a place where we can no longer take it for granted, though, as a community, and um, what is going to require uh, is 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 the community, all of it, to make a decision collectively, which I believe we will, um, that it is an important um, uh, function. Uh, it serves a lot of purposes in our town and, and it needs to be uh, refreshed. Um, it has infinite potential, really. There's so many things we can do with this event that, that, that we haven't. Uh, the volunteers that, uh, that work on it and the paid staff are, I watch them and they are tremendously overworked they put in great efforts all the time and they absolutely do their best but I think it is time for our community to um, to view this as an asset rather than uh, just something that happens every year no matter what um, I think uh, it is the envy of many communities our size I think there's a lot of communities in Ontario that would kill especially in this economic environment for an event like this and and I think um, we can't take it for granted. So um, I don't mean to, you know, end this on a bit of a downer. It's 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 a really positive thing because it's ours. And and I think in the future we're going to need to, um, um, like I said, make a bit of an investment in it so that it can uh, uh, increase its 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 scope and uh, maintain its longevity. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, Pierre, um, I, I guess I'd, I'd like some more specifics um, of exactly what you'd like to see besides the list of uh, yeah, in-kind no, contributions. Th those in-kind contributions are fantastic and have always been sort of part of, part of the makeup of, of what the, 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 the municipality contributes, which is very much appreciated. What we're finding is... Um, there's been a demographic shift because, I mean, last year we had bad weather, but there is a sense that um, attendance and, 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 and excitement level is waning in, in these festivals all over Ontario. So um, we need to address this and, and, and find ways to, to, um, to beef things up. Now, we have 
you know, the problem is it takes money to, to, to make money and it takes investment to find details out. Um, once this festival is over, um, this conversation, just for your information, started a bit late into the into this year's event planning. So we weren't really able to um, come up with a sort of cohesive plan as to what we need. But we have to start with information. So once this festival is over for this year, what we need to do is, is, is and we, we'll need to come back to council and collate who's coming, why are they coming, who isn't coming and why aren't they coming? Uh, what can we do to make them make them more interested? When we had uh, the concert, which we were only able to afford with a grant, we had a greater demographic. Um, did we do a good enough job of, 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 of securing those people and making sure that they would spend some money other than the $10 admission to see the band? Um, what else can we do in that regards? Are, are we doing enough with the food section? Are we doing enough with the car show section? There's many questions that I didn't want to, I don't, I didn't believe this was the correct forum, but what I wanted to do is just alert council that this is something we're going to need to discuss because, uh, you know, um, informally off the record, there are businessmen in town that, that are concerned that, 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 that we have no longer, it isn't the focus and, and, and we need to, we need to refocus ourselves on the event. Other comments or questions? Well, uh, I have a couple comments. First of all, I was been around when we very first started Pumpkin Fest, and it's been a community event since that time and grown, and we're right. We have had some great success. I think I, I agree with you, Pierre. I think there's lots of opportunity to grow it again, and I think we need some new ideas, and uh, I'm sure we'll do it. But that doesn't to say that this still isn't going to be the best, one of the best uh, festivals or, or uh, in, in southwestern Ontario continues to win awards in Ontario for uh, family fun, and I'm sure this year will be the same, regardless of the weather. But let's hope for really warm weather, and we'll all have a great time. Thanks very much, Brad. Thanks, Pierre. <coughs> Our next deputation is Jeff Peach and Pamela Scharf, and they're here on, uh, representing the Lake Huron Coastal Conservation. And welcome, Pamela. Thank you. And Jeff. Different presentation. Okay. Good evening. I'm the chair of the Lake Heron Center for Coastal Conservation, which I'll refer to. Um, oh, it's skipping ahead. Referred to from this point on as the Coastal Center, and I'm joined today by Jeff Peach, our Coastal Resource Manager. Um, the Coastal Centre is a one-of-a-kind organization in Ontario that has expertise in coastal environments. Uh, we're an Ontario-registered charity dedicated to the conservation of Lake Huron's natural shoreline through education, research, and conservation um, and community outreach. The Coastal Centre promotes wise, wise stewardship of Lake Huron's coastal ecosystems. And for the Deputy Mayor, who's the chair of the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority and other councillors who sit on that board, uh, this presentation I'm sorry, it's going to be a bit of a repeat that you saw last month, so my apologies. On behalf of the Board of Directors and the Coastal Centre staff, I do bring greetings to Council and Municipal staff and thank you for this opportunity to provide you with an update on the important work um, that we have been doing at the Coastal Centre and in your community. Um, and we also very much appreciate your continued uh, support. We have a board of 13 directors and one full-time education outreach coordinator, a part-time office administration assistant, and we retain the services of two coastal resource management consultants, one of which is Jeff. Our office is located in Goddard. Uh, we're right across from the town of Goddard Tourist Centre. And we invite you anytime if you're in Goddard, the office is open to drop in and see our location. Our geographical area is the southeast shore of Lake Huron from Topamori to Sarnia, and we've also begun to do work in Georgian Bay, which is basically, uh, it's, still, it's all part of the same water, body of water. Um, Jeff Peach and Pat Donnelly uh, founded the Coastal Centre in 1998, along with, the board, with board members, which included past chairs, Dr. Wayne Caldwell, who's department head for Guelph University's um, environmental Studies, and Matt Pearson, who's a partner of BM Ross and Associates, uh, engineers and consultants in, in Goddard, and they both sit on our technical advisory board. 
Our annual budget, uh, based on a five-year average, is 150,000. 65,000 of that is for staffing. 25,000 for operational costs, such as our office, and 60,000 for projects. Um, in the past, our income comes from such things as Trillium grants. Uh, we had a three-year grant for $117,000. Um, and 33,000 from sponsors and private donors. Um, this current year, we've received funding from Bruce Power for various projects, such as our Coastal Watchers project, and Bridge Green Power has given us a five-year restoration project at Bruce Dell Conservation in partnership with Saugeen Conservation to deal with the Phragmites. And based on our fiscal, which is from October to September, because that's when we were incorporated. We have a total income this year of $212,000, which is based on, um, we have 53,000 deferred revenue, 106 in current grants, 10,000 in sponsorship and donations, and uh, 44,000 from sources such as consulting income, inventory sales, miscellaneous income, and savings. We are a member of various organizations dealing with uh, the Great Lakes. Um, we also are a member of the International Association of Great Lake Researchers. A lot of our work is based on science and research. In 2012, we were awarded the uh, Ontario Minister's Award for Environmental Excellence, which is a great feather in our cap. We uh, began strategic priority um, uh, strategic priority uh, planning. Um, we did have a plan in place, but it, it needed to be revisited. So the board um, uh, participated in this in the last year, and we're cur currently working with Freshwater Futures located in Michigan, who provided the center with a grant and staff to assist us with operationalizing our updated strategic plan and to develop a marketing and fundraising plan. And this work is expected to be completed by the 1st of September. Our vision um, is a healthy Lake Huron coastal ecosystem. Our mission is we're a charitable nonprofit organization providing leadership and expertise through research, education, and stewardship outreach with partners for healthy coastal communities. And we focus our work uh, toward our vision through the following strategic uh, priorities. The first is biodiversity. Um, these are not in order of any uh, significance, they're all of equal importance. The biological diversity of Lake Huron's coast is being compromised by overdevelopment, fragmentation of forest areas, the spread of alien invasive species, and damage to sense of coastal environments. Climate change has far-reaching implications for Lake Huron environment. All of us who work, rest, or play along the Lake Huron coast are and will continue to be affected by climate change. Coastal processes, um, like w water level fluctuations, um, flooding, erosion, coastal wetland processes, and beach and dune systems are vital to the ecology of Lake Huron. This picture you're looking at is just south of the town of Godridge, um, where there's very, very uh, significant erosion going on there, to the point some cottages have had to be moved back or actually uh, torn down. And the last is uh, water quality. Um, the quality of our near shore coastal waters and estuaries uh, has become a point of great concern to the Lake Huron community in recent years. This is uh, the County of Huron's notice about uh, water quality that they post at their beaches. Our program objectives um, are broken into two streams, conservation and stewardship. Conservation of alvars, beaches, bluffs, coastal wetlands, dunes, gullies, um, through coastal surveys. Um, we've been doing this work. These all um, have impact on each other. Um, and all, and as we say, whatever the water is up the, at the watershed, it all ends up in the lake. Um, invasive species like Phragmites, also known as the common reed, is rapidly threatening the wetlands in Ontario and creating walls between people and the lake here in shoreline. It's often seen in roadside ditches and its seeds are being transported by vehicles and it's very difficult and expensive to get rid of once it takes hold. Uh, the photos that you're looking at on the top are Phragmites in Kincardine and the bottom was this year. Um, these are in Bruce Dale. So you can see the um, 
on the left and the bottom left. That was the wall, and this is the work from um, Enbridge of cutting down and trying to get rid of the Phragmites so people can actually get to the lake. We also have habitat conservation and restoration of beaches, wetlands, and species at risk. Um, this is our cottage. Um, when I joined the Coastal Center in talking to Jeff about, and I'm a lifelong cottager, um, talking about how to protect the cottage and the beach. Um, and it's as simple as taking some driftwood, um, and we made a path from the cottage down to the beach, and this grass here is after one year. Um, and now the dunes that are on either side of that walkway is amazing, um, and it's protecting our cottage now with the high water levels. If we could only get the neighbors on either side of us to do the same thing would help. Uh, water levels, uh, this is definitely a climate change impact. Um, we've gone from people being complaining and complaining about the low lake levels and now all of a sudden we're complaining back again to complaining about the high water levels. With respect to water quality, algae, beach monitoring, E. coli, and non-point uh, pollution sources, um, all of these have an impact on our water quality. We also have, as part of this program, our Coast Watcher program. It's a community volunteer program. It, we call them our citizen scientists who live along the lakeshore, and they are, they're able to be our eyes and ears on the coastline um, during the summer months. They gather important information for us, such as water temperature, amount of rainfall, uh, wave action, which way the wind's uh, blowing, and anything that they see unusual that's on the lake. And the second uh, program component is stewardship. Um, we have uh, two programs that we've developed. One is Green Ribbon Beach. Um, this is fashioned after the Blue Flag Beach because the Blue Flag Beach is an international program that is meant for public beaches. This is for uh, rural beaches. So in the case of this community, any beaches that would be south of Port Elgin or north of Southampton, whether they were municipal beaches or private beach associations, they could apply to um, be an award winner. In 2012, the township of here in Kinloss was actually recognized as a first recipient for their foresight commitment and local leadership in coastal conservation. The Green Ribbon Champion is for um, individual property owners, and this is a pilot project that we got funding for that we've been doing in Tiny Township in Georgia Bay. We also have a program called Living Beaches. This is where we do in-class and field trips for students uh, to learn about the beaches, everything from cleaning the beaches to uh, planting dune grasses. This is actually Saugeen Shores. Um, this was a beach cleanup as part of that uh, Living Beach Education Program. And we've also done coastal stewardship educational series in Saugeen Shores. Um, we also, this is Karen Alexander, our education and outreach uh, coordinator. Um, she was part of the Waterfront Environment uh, Speaker Series um, this summer. This is um, part of a program we were involved with in installing boardwalks in Port Elgin. Uh, we were asked to add um, education and awareness to the project by delivering a presentation to the tech students who actually built the boardwalk. We also have another program. Um, it's uh, butt-free beaches. It's not smoke-free beaches. It's butt-free beaches. Um, it's uh, Butts on the beach uh, cause a lot of problems, um, everything from toddlers picking up butts to um, having ingestion by birds and uh, the toxins that are in the uh, filter do leach into the water and the plastic that's in the filter, it doesn't break down, it's plastic. We had in 2013 Grand Bend and Station Beach um, in Concordant participated. And it's the first of its kind in Ontario. Um, in 2014, we had Inverhuron Beach, and in 2015, Sobo Beach, Canaterra uh, Beach in Sarnia, and the main beach in Godridge. So in terms of our program de delivery, I already mentioned that it's accomplished through our research, education, and community programs. Uh, we've developed a bluff stewardship guide and a native plant guide for landowners, and we work with local uh, nurseries to help educate them to tell cottagers what kind of plants they should or shouldn't be planting. Um, we have developed an erosion indicator checklist for municipalities and landowners. 
Um, I've already mentioned the living beaches in class and field trips for students. We've organized beach cleanups, uh, dune grass plantings. We provide annual updates uh, at beach association meetings on a request. Um, we also represent the Lake Huron community at international, national, and provincial Great Lakes meetings and conferences. So in terms of the benefits for the funding, what you're getting for your funding as a municipality, we are a one-of-a-kind organization, as I've already mentioned. Um, we have access to technical information and advice. Um, we have a preferred uh, fee for extensive services over and above what you've already contributed if you've got special projects. We're uh, able to bring in grant dollars to local uh, coastal projects such as beach cleanups. Um, there are also some fundings that municipalities can't get at, but they could through, through us as a nonprofit. Um, we do provide regular updates through our monthly e-news, uh, annual program summaries and per periodic releases. We did do a couple years ago one on water level position statement. When the water was low and Jeff, uh, through his research, predicted the water was going to come back and it was going to come back fast and he was right on about that. And we provided that to all the municipalities. We also com comment on government initiatives and special issues on behalf of the Lake Huron shoreline, such as plastic pollution, and also we don't want to see windmills out in the lake. With respect to soggy shores, um, we have participated on waterfront uh, review committee. Uh, Jeff recently did a review of your uh, waterfront design. Um, we participate in meetings and contacts with Port Elk and uh, Beachers about local beach concerns. Um, we attend, uh, assist municipal staff with developing and implementing Phragmites control programs, providing oversight during herbicide application. Um, we have hosted seminars on Phragmites and beach stewardships at the Bruce County Museum. And Karen um, Alexander has met with municipal staff to walk the municipal beaches and discuss the changes occurring due to high uh, water levels, uh, to talk about the no gr grooming regime at Port Elk and, and invasive species. And we've also um, stopped at Chantry Dunes to discuss sand management. <laughs> We have, through our Coast Watcher program, recruited volunteers from Port Elgin and Southampton. Uh, we've consulted on new beach signs for Southampton. Sorry about the misspelling there, or separating the words. Um, we uh, were able to assist with the Grey Bruce Foundation grant for the Port Elgin Boardwalk. Um, we did beach cleanups through our beach, uh, Living Beaches program. And we also were involved in the Bruce Power Eco Mentor program and visited schools in Port Elgin and Southampton to discuss plastics pollution. And we've provided presentations in the area. We did three last year. And this year we did the, participate in the Here and Fringe Birding Festival in May and the Saugeen Field Naturalists in March. So just to wrap up, um, the work that we do at the Coastal Centre is all about the precious resource that so many of us have come to enjoy during our four seasons that contributes to the health of our community from personal health and well-being to a healthy economy. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Pamela. And Jeff, any questions for Pamela? Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Pamela, th thanks so much for the presentation. You're and uh, and I, I am a true believer that your organization does some great work. Um, the question is, one of the, one of the things that uh, as a municipality we struggle with is there are many government organizations that regulate what we can and can't do when it comes to don't do grade the beach, don't grade the beach, spray the beach, don't spray the beach, uh, all the different things that we have to, and there, there's MOE, MNR, uh, all the different organ do, do you does your organization have any um, any influence over some of the the regulations that are imposed upon us because we we apply for uh, a, a grant to uh, do one thing and then say you yes. can't so sometimes it would be good to have an advocate in our corner that uh, could give us some sound advice yeah but part of the problem is when you have um, government agencies at the provincial level who 
say different things, have different philosophies or agendas. Um, so one of the things, for example, we recently uh, were a member of the Ontario Phragmites Working Group, and the province will not allow uh, water-treated herbicide for the Phragmites that's in the water, such as what the picture we showed at Brucedale. So we um, advocated and signed our name to the letter of a long list of organizations that want, it, if it's okay in the United States, why can't Canada catch up for it to be okay here? Because people do not realize how fast this is becoming a problem and taking root, and, and it's not a beautiful tall grass. It is a very, it's one of the worst invasive species we've ever seen from a plant perspective. So I wouldn't say that we would have influence. What we do have as a nonprofit is we are able to be an independent voice to be able to bring the partners to the table. So if a municipality is having issues and we have, Jeff has great contacts uh, at all the ministries that have anything to do with water, which there are many of them. Um, and so we've had times where we've had to almost sit down and be the, the broker to, to get the issue on the table and to come at it from a science perspective, not an emotional perspective, but from a common sense science-based perspective. And we have a long history of doing that, and that's part of your dollars at work. Um, and when a project gets very involved, though, we, as I said in my presentation, we do have a preferred rate from the municipality, and we would cost out if it was something that was going to be really involved. But if it's just getting together for a meeting to hash out an issue, that's what we're here for and that's what your donation to us is helping you. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation again, Pamela, and uh, it was just as interesting the second time through as the first thank time. You. Thank uh, you. Maybe more, yeah. I, uh, I actually kind of wanted to follow up on what you just uh, said there, actually, and, and maybe sort of reverse what... Uh, my colleague, Councillor Mayette, uh, was talking about in terms of how perhaps Soggy Shores could help with what you guys are trying to do through the Ontario Phragmites Working Group to advocate for some of those things. I have the letter here that you signed, and it's interesting, just a couple of things out of it that it, and it's not, the, the letter seeks expedited and streamlined approval of herbicides to enable control over water, expedited and streamlined approval of aerial treatments for Phragmites that, establish a province-wide Phragmites control program and support the proposed Invasive Species Act. And, uh, I mean, all of those things are important things. And we just heard at our last council meeting from the Director of Public Works, uh, um, we, we just recently got our license to uh, apply uh, glyphosate for another five years, uh, but only in areas that aren't covered in water. And, of course, because the lake is rising, fewer and fewer areas are not covered with water all the time. So this is a pretty critical issue for us, and I was, uh, I, it's my intention at uh, the next Conservation Authority meeting in September to introduce a resolution supporting this, uh, this letter and to send it on to the relevant ministries, and I think it would be useful for this council and other councils along the lakeshore affected by Phragmites to do the same thing. And I just, I guess, uh, um, so that's a track that, that I'm going to push going forward. I guess, is there anything else that we can do? Uh, as uh, a municipality to uh, move along some of these things that are going to become increasingly necessary to control Phragmites. We've had great luck in Sogging Shores in the last few years and we've gotten pretty good control, but we could lose that control very quickly because of the changing dynamic. And so um, I'd be interested to hear your comments on that. I think, um, you know, there's two other organizations where this needs to get on the agenda, and that's AMA and Roma as well. Um, and those conversations, you're, if you're able to have those conversations with the Minister of Environment um, and m &R around the, pro the province, from our perspective, isn't stepping up to the plate on this issue. They're, they're putting it on the backs of the municipalities, and there needs to be an Ontario-wide strategy. It is everywhere, and it's, it, people don't realize even those little roadside ditches, um, those, those are little wetlands that are leading to the lake. It, it, it's sucking up the water everywhere, and it is going to have a, it is and will continue to have a disastrous effect on the shoreline. Councillor Renage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So much to ask and say in so little time, but let's try anyway. Uh, notwithstanding the emotional uh, thinking about uh, a lovely little bird that's got love in the middle of the P and the R. So um, what I'd like to know is, is uh, 
if we could work with a more maybe pragmatic approach to all these problems, I'm, I'm hearing the comments that we're talking about beach wars, that we're going to hear another deputation here, to, dele delegation, sorry, here tonight, and uh, they're going to speak to the, uh, the sand the, and, and the, uh, the human species that would like to enjoy the sand and, and, and earn some money from it uh, because that's their, their, their need as well. So what I would like to do is ask you a question, Mr. Mayor, and then ask a question. So I'll, I'll reverse that. Can I ask a question about why windmills was suddenly thrown in here? What is the problem with putting windmills in the lake? Um, the, pro the reason why I put it in there, because it was something that we were actually asked by the Minister of Agriculture at the time to comment on. It's um, new technology that is um, in terms of the Great Lakes. There is no research on the impact of putting them out there, and especially with the winter and the winter ice, it's different than the seas that they've been put, put in off in the UK, and off of Denmark. Um, and we... Our concern is we're just saying to the government, you need to research this first before you start popping them up into the lake. Um, we're concerned about the breakdowns. Uh, there, if there's oil, there's lots of things. There's the 20-year shelf life of them. Are we going to have a sea of them out in the lake? Um, there's also concerns about the migratory bir birds. There's already some early indications that it's affecting, they're affecting the bat, look, the bats inland. Uh, we're worried about the birds out in the lake. It's looking at the greater e ecological system that we have and everything that you do has a cause effect relationship and that's all we're asking the government to do is before you start popping them up into the lakes, our great lakes where we get our drinking water from, most of us, um, make sure that you've done your research and your science on it. Because this government was ready to put them out in Lake Erie only four years ago. Thank you for that. Um, I sense that uh, here on Centre for Coastal Conservation has shown they have emotions too. Mr. Mayor, what I'd like to, uh, to ask you is, is there room for us to, to, to address this issue along our 18 and a half kilometres where a few of those kilometers, maybe a couple, are heavily populated beach use areas. And we have got a public that is taking the law into their own hands. We've seen evidence of it. And I'm thinking that we need to, to say that this is a crisis and we need a committee to work on it so that we don't have to listen to the phone calls, receive the emails, have the delegations that say we're not doing the right thing, bring the people in, have the education, have the communication, and, and is there room for this between now and next year? Thank you. First of all, I... Uh, okay, uh, you said this issue, and I, I'm not clear, can you be very specific about what issue you're talking about? Well, I can, and it's, uh, it's about the wet beach versus the dry beach and how the methodology is, whether you grade it, whether you don't grade it, whether you install dune grasses and, and, and work the dune system. I'm also concerned. I, I was down there this afternoon and, and recognized that uh, we lost prop. The picture that they had up there uh, at the beginning of the presentation showed about 50% more beach in Port Elgin, Main Beach than there is there. Uh, today, and there's another 10 feet less now today because of the south, strong southwest winds and the south winds. It's, uh, it's right up against uh, where we installed a volleyball court pole. So it wasn't there before, and I've got pictures to prove it. So a lot of this is about the quality of the sand, the quality of the family beach that the families can come to, and uh, how much is left, and whether or not it's wet or dry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still a little confused, Neil. I, I, by all means, I think we need. I think this is an issue that is certainly high priority with with not only staff, but we've heard a number of issues on both sides of it. I can assure you, so so it's not an issue that it, that is uh, an easy solution. I think uh, part of the, the plan a number of years ago to address that was to develop a waterfront master plan, which we have done, and 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 the waterfront committee which is trying to implement that and and there was a number of recommendations in that waterfront plan that address these very issues you talked to so um uh, yeah. 
So I, you know, I don't know that we need another committee. We have the waterfront committee that's looking at the implementation of that waterfront plan, and I think, uh, given some time, they're like, it will always come down to priorities and money. And I think, uh, um, let's see where it goes. Councillor Mayan, Mike Mayan. Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Pamela, and uh, welcome, and, and welcome to Jeff Peach too. We've had a a lot, of, a lot of great dealings with Jeff over the years, and he's provided a lot of good advice to the town of Saugeen Shores for certain. My question to you, Pamela, and perhaps Jeff, I don't know who wants to speak on this, but we have a, an information report on our agenda a little, a little later on this evening from our, our Director of Community Services, Jane Jagolowski, and uh, I just want to read you a line in here. I'd like you to make a comment on this. Um, effective watership stewardship is a function of balancing environmental, social, and economic interests. And I guess uh, my question of you or to, or to Jeff, whoever wished to answer it, is when we talk about balancing environmental, social, and economic interests, um, tourism being, I believe, our number one economic generator, um, we've had a lot of concerns, uh, you know, presented to us this year about, about the, the, I call it the uh, snake grass or sedge, sedge uh, grass. But um, what, what, what your, in terms of your board, your position, on um, discussions around um, positions around balancing environmental, social, and economic interests. Do you dwell more so, uh, obviously, it's coastal preservation um, on, the, on the environmental side. I mean, there is a whole social side Absolutely. and economic interest side. And we, you know, this council and previous councils have placed a lot of faith, trust, confidence in the statements that particularly when, when Jeff comes to town and, and states this is, this is his position. Um, what, what, what is your stance in terms of, of the balance between environmental, social, and economic interests? I'm just going to read back to you my last statement. Um, the work we do is all about the precious resource that so many of us have come to enjoy all four seasons that contributes to the health of our community from personal health and well-being to a healthy economy. We take all of that into consideration. We have a very diverse board, uh, everything from PhDs to former mayors to scientists. My background is public health, environmental health. So we have the full gamut of those expertise at the table because it's just not about the environment. We have to take into consideration the economy and the health of the individual well-being and the health of the community, which includes the economy, the tourism. So when we have our discussions, we make sure that those are always included in our discussions um, so that we have it um, as sort of an overarching umbrella to make sure that it doesn't get lopsided. Uh, the one thing with the environment, though, it's Mother Nature, right? You, you, you can't fight Mother Nature. And the, the picture I showed you of our cottage, um, that was just letting the grasses grow. Uh, we have am amazing dunes now. Um, and we went, actually, before we came today, we went to Global, Glo what is it? Global's Grove and went to the main beach. I wanted to, see, in, the, in the heavy rain, I wanted to see how the water was flowing. Um, and um, one of the things with the grasses, and yeah, they're, the, na they're, the sedges are nasty. They're not, even, even the Lake Huron um, natural native grasses, um, they're not fun to step on because they've got a really sharp, um, the grasses that I showed you in that picture. But the thing that they do do is they hold the sand. And what I noticed, uh, the grove, is that the lake, it kind of goes down to the water. Then there's this, um, it's built up and then it comes back down. And there's an interaction between the water that's coming down the road, off the parking lot. It's intermixing. Not today, but you, I know it will be intermixing. You can see the big grooves of the water that comes off. Um, so it's trying to find that storm water management plan that will work and not impact on the beaches either. But those grasses do hold the sand, and you need to hold the sand during high water levels. Um, because if you don't have something in place, then over time, because the, the lake gets up and down, it's taken a long time to come back. Normally it's on a seven year and a 40 year cycle. The 40 year took longer to come back than normal. Um, at our beach, uh, we, had, we have these two rocks that little kids love to dive off of. And last year, the water, first time in anybody's recollection, was past those rocks. Now you can't even see the rocks. They're back covered over with water and the water's up high again. So it's, 
It's trying to come up with a, a long-range plan to try to take into consideration Mother Nature and what she does, at the same time trying to protect uh, the tourism part, the aesthetics. Uh, we know people don't like those grasses, but it's trying to come up with a way that you can manage and keep everybody happy, and it's not an easy task. Um, but that's like right now, um, from, from our perspective, we wouldn't suggest you do anything this fall. We need to see what the storm energy is going to be like this fall, what the ice is going to be like this winter, and then think about what it's going to look, see what it looks like in the spring, and start talking then if you're looking at that kind of perspective. Um, you can't have a knee-jerk reaction to this. You really have to think about it over the long term. And if we don't have the in-house expertise, we have a board of technical advisors who are, are <coughs> at our disposal to help municipalities to come up with a, a good plan that hopefully everybody can live with. Councillor Rich. Thanks for your presentation, Pamela. Um, my question is not about beach grass or anything. One of the things that I thought was interesting about your presentation was uh, your public awareness campaign about smoking on the beach or not using the beach as an ashtray because I think that we always run into a little bit of difficulty if we try and legislate things like that and we don't have the enforcement to back it up so as a public awareness campaign one did you find it effective and two how did you gauge gauge its effectiveness okay thank you uh, councillor it actually isn't a smoke-free beach campaign it's a butt-free beach campaign. I think eventually you're going to see the province, once all the municipalities decide to make their beaches smoke-free, then the province will make the edict and go, here's your, here's your legislation, which, oh, thank you very much, but we've already done it, as we know has happened in the past with smoke-free public places as well. The concept, be, it's a butt-free beach. We don't want people, because people just think, well, there's the sand, we'll just stick the cigarette in there, right? So it's, a, it's a, actually, it's a novel concept. We have these cute signs says, you know, I'm a beach, uh, you know, uh, be a beach bum, not a beach butt. And we have these um, through a grant actually through the province, these little ashtrays that you fold them, makes like a cone, you put sand in it, it's your ashtray for the day. And when you leave the beach, there's nice disposal areas to get rid of your butts. There's actually even a company that will take the butts and recycle them. It's the plastic in the filter if, if for those that are smokers, uh, if you didn't know this, I can tell you the filter in your cigarette is made of plastic. It's not degradable. It doesn't break down, and the toxins from the butt, they're all in the butt now because you smoke the cigarette. Then they, they leach, and they get into the water as well, and, and uh, birds and um, fish are eating them as well too. I mean, they're found when they open birds and also fish, the scientists at the provincial level. So it's not a smoke-free beach. It's just we don't want little kids putting butts in their mouth. We want to keep the butts off the beach, that's all. Very effective. Oh, well, we're now at five beaches, um, and people love it because it's, it's a, just a common sense thing that you think it's common sense until you educate people and they go, I never thought about that. I always just stuck my, you know, my butt in, into the sand. And so we just give them, it's just a novel, cute way to, to educate you about your butts and so that we don't have the butts. It's the number one pollution source that's found during the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Thousands and thousands of cigarette butts. If there's no further questions, then uh, first of all, I've been very educated about butts this evening. <laughs> 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 and I appreciate that, but thanks very much, Pamela and uh, Jeff. Uh, I, I can assure you that this is a topic of great interest in our community about uh, the condition of our beaches and maintenance policies. And uh, we thank you for the input you've given us in the past, and I'm sure we'll look to you in the future for advice and stewardship. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, the next deputation is uh, John Mann, and he's here about our procedural bylaw. Thank you. Initially, before I get started, I noticed there's a sign in Ralph's Highway Shop at it says liquidation sale. I would encourage council to make Ralph's Highway Shop at a heritage site so that we can enjoy Ralph's forever in this town. Now to get to something that's a little more serious in my mind. I'm asking this council to repeal uh, section 14.11 of the um, 
procedural bylaw that was just passed in the last month. 14.11 of the uh, procedural bylaw of the town states, and I quote, a delegation once heard shall not be entitled to be heard on the same topic for a period of six months from the date of first being heard without prior permission of council. I say that that is, that's end quote, I say that that section is an absolute violation on its face of the fundamental right of every citizen to communicate with this council, their elected officials, in a public forum. And uh, the, the bylaw itself says, we'll tell you, citizen, you councilor telling the citizen what topic we're going to hear. Well, that, in my view, is an absolute violation of that fundamental right of every citizen to communicate. It's an absolute violation of his right to freedom of speech. If he wants to comment on anything, he or she, whatever citizen wants to comment on, they have that absolute right. Um, and it be, it be it the same topic, so be it. And particularly when one is challenging counsel, their government, challenging or criticizing their government, and you're saying, well, we don't hear you challenging us again for six months. Unbelievable, frankly. This is the bylaw that you passed, the procedural bylaw, 28 pages. This is the former bylaw in 2002, 15 pages. It doubled in size. This seven-page document is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Seven pages of substance that controls the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms of every citizen in Canada. And it's one quarter the size of this procedural bylaw, which is just procedure and no substance. You are wallowing in a morass of procedure. And one wonders why. This bylaw, procedural bylaw, came to light on June 22nd, in my view. I, I reviewed the uh, agendas on June 22nd, 2015, this year, for the first time. And I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong on that. But it was brought by Larry Ellison, the CAO. Already drafted. This is the new bylaw, comment. He uh, submitted to all you elected officials. I want to know what communication was had among our elected officials that said, hey, let's double the size of our procedural bylaw. And more importantly, I want to know who said, hey, if somebody brings a topic, Let's stop them from coming again for six months. I want to know who thought that was a good idea, who drafted it, and what discussion was had on it. It's just mind-boggling. And I have some personal experience on this with Bruce County Council right now. Just in the last two hours, I received an email saying, I cannot present my delegation to my Bruce County Council as a citizen on September 10th at their regular scheduled meeting. Not only that, they prohibited me from giving this de my delegation on August 6, 2015, saying it's the same topic. Well, I can tell you, I couldn't have even brought it before I brought it on August 6, and I couldn't have brought the one I'm doing for September 10 before September 10. It is not the same topic. What am I left for? Left to? Oh, bring a civil action. Bring a mandamus. Oh, that's easy. That costs nothing. That's what a citizen is left for, left with. Unbelievable. I, I would, and I assume there will be no discussion about this. I will assume that uh, you'll just carry on as though nothing happened. I want to know why. Our CAO had a drafted 28-page document for your consideration. And, I mean, just look at it in common sense. How many times do people come up here within six months and give you the uh, same topic over and over? 
other than the DGR, I don't know many. Coincidental that this happened during the DGR two years? Because I can tell you this, I was told a couple times along this two-year journey with the DGR that I'd already given a same topic deputation at that time, and I couldn't do it again. I said, well, where does it say that? Well, it's not in your old bylaw. The old bylaw only has one paragraph about a de deputation. The new one has 14 new paragraphs about deputations. Unbelievable. I would prefer you to tear up this procedural bylaw and put a welcome sign above this door and say, come on in, what can we do for you today? And let's hear from you. Instead of censoring us. In my view, this is what, what has happened is it's become a culture of secrecy here. Culture of secrecy. We can't trust you. And uh, there's just no um, inclusion. We're not included in the process. And when you lose those two, you've lost all democracy. And this is the fundamental right. It's the core, it's the cornerstone. What I'm talking about, me addressing my council in front of the public on webcast for all citizens to hear. It's the cornerstone of our foundation of our democracy. And to be treated like this, no respect whatsoever. I can't say enough bad things about it. And to say, oh, we can write you. We can call you on the phone. I, I've written you. I wrote you this dele delegation. Only Don Matheson re said, said I received it. I asked for a read receipt. Council person uh, Matheson read it. I believe Linda White uh, sent a receipt. If I'm wrong, somebody can correct me on that. But there was no response, none from any of you. But what does it matter to me? If I'm, if I'm communicating with you, I don't need you to, I need you to respond to me, but I want you to respond to all of my, all fellow citizens. That's how democracy works. Everybody hears it. So there's no substitute, oh, you can write us. That's no substitute for in the public forum that we're here on. This is not some private club you're running here. You work for us, you, are, you have the privilege of being elected by us, and we run the show. If we want to say something, we can. And if I'm nuts uh, about what I'm saying, tell me I'm nuts. I, you know, tell me why I'm wrong. And, and, and let every other citizen come up and say I'm nuts. But that's how democracy works. You don't just say, we already heard from you, and oh, we gave you a whole 10 minutes. We gave you 10 minutes. Six months later, you can come. Come again. Unbelievable. Um, I know two councillors didn't vote for it, uh, for this uh, proposal or the bylaw. Uh, councillors uh, Grace and uh, Minaj. Um, but there was no, there was absolutely no discussion about it. None. Oh, a bit. Uh, there, Council President Grace. Oh, some, there was some discussion. You know, there was. It's it's vague. Vague. Well, sure, it's vague. It's it's unconstitutional. Oh, what's a topic? Oh, we'll discuss that for a day or two. But the point is, before it even gets to you, the uh, staff is stopping it. Is the staff running this show or what? The staff will say you're not getting on the docket. And that almost happened to me twice on the old bylaw, as I said. I'm, I'm probably over my 10 minutes now. Um, You're over your 10 minutes now, John, so I'll give you a couple seconds to finalize and we're going to move on. I, well, I, I hope that there's a discussion today, and I hope more than that that there's discussions all the time. There should be debate among you. We should know what's going on. There's absolutely none in my view, none. And uh, I thanks, Don. I, I Thank you, John. That, uh, 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. Our next deputation is Jeff Page, and he's here. Is there no uh, questions or any questions for Mr. Mann? Councilor Minaj. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, John. Um, before I ask the question, I would like to ask you to reflect on how you just presented yourself. And, and uh, I was in the audience with you for for all of that DGR hearing over and over again, and you did bring up the same topics over again, and I just wanted to let you know that. So as far as a debate, we had two healthy debates. We did ask for revisions. Would you, would you accept a revision? If we were to put a revision in that said something along the lines of, you're bringing new information forward, and it's not a regurgitation or a twisting or a slanting of the old information just so that you can get your point across repeatedly, would you accept a revision to that part of the bylaw that says new information deserves something more than a wait of six months? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would not do that. I, w I would say if I wanted to read verbatim what I just told you today, I should be able to do that at any council meeting I want. You shouldn't be able to tell me, well, we've heard that before. I don't care if you have heard it before. I'll tell you again if I'm not satisfied with what I got here. And I'm not satisfied. No okay, I think, we, I think we've heard enough on this particular yeah. topic, John. Thank well, you. Well, We're going to move on. Okay, I, and there. I think you've answered that adequately. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next deputation. Thank you, any Mr. Other Ma questions? Thank you, Mr. Mann. I'll ask if there's any other questions, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Our next deputation is Jeff Page. Welcome, Jeff, and you hear about changing beach conditions. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, mayors, council members, and fellow attendants. Uh, thank you for welcoming me here tonight. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. And uh, my name is Jeff Page. I am a resident of Elora, Ontario. Uh, very much like Port Elgin because we have an attraction for people to come to, and our attraction is the Gorge. Um, I've been a visitor to Port Elgin for more than 40 years, specifically Goebbels Grove because I have uh, family friends, they're like second parents to me, they have a cottage, and I've existed at that beach for many, many years. Um, I'm not a landowner, um, and the cottage has been there since the 30s, so it's one of these historic ones, you, you step into the cottage, it's like being on Golden Pond once again. It's a, it's a fantastic spot to be. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to have permission to present to Council tonight uh, the changes that, that I have seen happen to Goebbels Grove. We all choose to either be tourists or residents at Goebbels Grove and Port Elgin specifically because it's such a beautiful place. Port Elgin is touted as having one of the most beautiful sunsets in the world, and this beautiful beach draws people. Goebbels Grove offers all of this, but specifically it offers beaches. Now, we do have Pumpkin Fest, which is a fantastic event each year. We've gone over that tonight, and it was great to be following them. We also have the big band event that happens. These events are weekend events. It's the beach that draws people to Port Elgin. Um, I know from the article in last week's Beacon, entitled uh, Less Beach Equals Hot Tempers, that uh, Councillor Mayette is aware and has stated about Southampton that the town's greatest asset is the beaches. So aside from that, what draws people to Port Elgin? Well, there's been a lot of changes that have happened over the last little while. Um, and the, the beach is the reason. And a lot of times uh, things have happened to uh, Global's Grove over time because there are some things that are needed in order to attract people to that area. So some upgrades that have happened that council has passed. We have a brand new sign at Global's Grove. It's, it's very nice to come down the hill, CAW, and see that sign. We have changes to the uh, change house. There's wheelchair access to it. There's landscaping. There's great gardens. A lot of volunteer efforts go into that to keep that nice. We have the boardwalk that, that, is, that is good to lead down to the beach for, for some reasons, and I'll show that a little bit later. Uh, the installation of drainage. And um, I know that uh, it's dry for the parking area and it's dry for the main beach area in front of that parking lot. There are new waste bins, and they're, they're emptied daily, which, which is important. And there's testing for E. coli. Thanks, Council, for these changes. Uh, your efforts are noticed. 
The Port Elgin, Port Elgin tourism website highlights Goebbels Grove for its beaches, but much of the beach has disappeared. Some do the cycle of higher water levels, which have been predicted and it came on quickly as, as predicted by Mr. Peach. And uh, southwest of the Change House, though, there's marshy, grassy conditions that have overtaken the beach area. What started out as naturalization and conservation has become a lack of management. An imbalance exists at Goebbels Grove. As Mr. Po Peach uh, has noted in his uh, Beach and Dune Guidelines Manual for Sogging Shores, was a 2003 report. Um, he notes that uh, effective waterfront stewardship, as uh, Councillor Mayette said, is a, function, is a function of balancing environmental, social, and economic interests. So here's the sign of Goebbels Grove. Um, and the official tourism website for Port, Port Elgin states, specifically, it's up on, on the board there, south of Port Elgin is a sandy beach for those seeking more peace and quiet and less activity. Miles of sandy beach stretch out along Goebbels Grove with not a fast food restaurant in sight. Shallow water, swing sets, white sand, and washing facilities at Goebbels only make this a relaxing beach for, for adults, teens, and children. Type of beach, sandy and shallow. Also, the Bruce County Tourism Guide points out that there is 450 meters long of white sandy beach. Well, these descriptions are not truth today because this is a picture that I took uh, 2015, August 15th, uh, at Goebbels Grove, and you'll see that uh, there is the, uh, the spiny grass that we were being talked uh, about earlier, and it is uh, encompassing almost the entire area southwest of the parking lot area. Nobody wants to come to Goebbels Grove uh, to sit in their chair for an afternoon here, have their children play in this environment because it's taking over a great deal of the beach. Uh, it has limited access for tourists. Here is a slide from Google Earth. This is 2014, so there's a little bit more um, beach because the water is a little bit further down. But you can see here, uh, we have CW Road, uh, Sogging Beach Road. Uh, here's the boardwalk, and there's the, the beach house. And we have the playground, and this little path here, that's a little pathway that uh, cottages have built with sand. Um, it, it's a good, it's good practice. Uh, there was the volleyball court that another uh, cottager put in. It was fantastic for enjoyment for people that came to the beach. But you'll see from this expanse, we have approximately 200 meters of sandy beach area. That's the maintained area from the parking lot. And we have about 300 meters of beach grasses and swampland with a 75 meter gap here uh, in depth. So we basically have 40% beach, 60% swamp grass. This needs attention from the council. Here are some other photos taken at the same time. So we're taking a look from the beach area that's maintained southwest and you can see that there's a swamp grass uh, in front of the boardwalk even getting people to the boardwalk to get back to the pool at uh, the pool house, sorry, the, uh, the change house. This is backing up a little bit and this is the, uh, the water that was being talked about earlier. Um, and that's not really actually water coming across because it's a dry period right now. That's actually springs that have always been there. So that, that will always exist unless uh, it is totally dried up. And I think that big O tubing is directing it onto either side of those beach areas. Um, here's, a, here's another photo looking up towards the playground. You'll see the whoops. You'll see the, uh, the boy here. He's actually armpit high in the grasses getting over to the boardwalk to either go to the playground or to the change houses. Uh, here's the boardwalk. It leads straight down to some, some roots that, yes, they're holding uh, that area, but it is a drop-down area that's, that's frankly a bit unsafe. Grassy shelf that people must actually navigate to get into the water um, from this point. And you can see the, the diverse condition between over here, where the maintained area is, is and the unmaintained area. Uh, narrow beach path where people sit, not much space, people have to pass through the water um, and wavy times, uh, windy times in order to get back and forth. It never used to be this way. Um, and here are some photos from 2005, 2007, my holiday period uh, with my family for, for some of the times. Um, here's my son, uh, he's a lot older now, but you can see the, uh, the beach is an area where the kids can, can dig 
uh, make holes, those big holes that have water in them, that they're goopy, that they play, and they bury each other. They can have fun because they're not getting caught up in weeds and lost in the weeds, frankly. Uh, families can do beach things because, guess what? It is a beach, and it is enjoyable. Uh, my father was Second World War amputee. I would uh, bring him to the uh, parking lot area, and I would drag the wheelchair over in front of the beach house. He'd spend the day there. Uh, I could no longer do that now because of the weeds and the marsh conditions. It's, it's not accessible for people. Uh, we need to bring back the beaches. And as you can see at the very back of this photo, there actually is uh, a grassy section of dune that has been retained. And uh, there is a healthy balance between beach and also retention. So why is it important? Well, tourism and summer months are critical for many small businesses. I don't have a business, but I do bring business to the area. Uh, and the beaches are a beautiful attraction for them. Port Elgin website claims miles of beautiful sand uh, that is no longer true of Goebbels Grove area. Uh, people are deciding to vacation elsewhere. I have two friends that asked me earlier this springtime, what are the beaches like? One was a, a renter that came uh, four years running. Um, he didn't come because of the beaches, from the photos he saw. Another friend of mine wanted to come for a weekend. He was going to stay at the Super 8 at $200 a night for three nights. Uh, he decided to actually go to Sobel Beach, and he's renting there and giving his dollars for his food, for his restaurants, for, um, for any groceries, for any things he might buy for his family to Sobel Beach area. Well, why has it happened? Well, the area that's consistently been graded um, is in really good shape at the parking lot area. And from the parking lot, though, uh, to the change house southwest of the point, there's been no maintenance for years. And possibly improper grading at one point has resulted in wet grass overtaking the beach. Well, what can be done? Well, we could rototill the area and remove a portion of it. And I'm saying all of it. It has to be a balance. And the grass dune area has to exist. It has to retain those sands because sands are not replenishing. They are from nature. They're from the glacial area uh, era, and they need to be staying in, in the beach area in order for it to be a beach. Uh, we could bring in sand and big go tubing for drainage, as was done at the parking lot area. It could be done the southwest of the parking lot area too. Sand fences as Mr. Peach has noted in the 2003 document, need to be strategically placed from late fall to early spring, and not just the parking lot area, but all the way down to the point. Um, guided pathways, as was shown in, uh, in the photo earlier tonight with the two pieces of driftwood, guides people, and it keeps them on a pathway and keeps them from destroying the dune areas. Um, we could have post and rope barriers that are down at the main beach area. Interpretive signs, like in Southampton, make it an educational project for people, for families, for kids, so that it's an interest thing as well as an education thing. Grooming and grading, like other beach areas. I'm not sure why other beaches and parts of Goebbels Grove, Goebbels Grove have been uh, groomed, but uh, Southwest has not been done for years. I believe that a meeting was held on August 26, 2010, and as a result, grading was advised to take place in the spring of 2011, uh, for this part of Goebbels Grove, but the grading never happened. Uh, American beach grass can be plant planted also. All these are solutions. It promotes 30 times higher sand retention uh, than just bare ground level. It's not invasive either, like the Phragmites. Uh, just like the main beach at Port Elgin and Southampton has these, these beach grasses. Goebbels Grove can once again become the way it used to be through consistent, planned, and scheduled management and maintenance that will make Goebbels Grove an attractive beach once again. Uh, here are two examples. The main beach area on the right uh, of Goebbels Grove, parking lot area, great beach, great sand, parking area, but it's not big enough any longer because people are coming and they need to branch further down to the southwest as they used to be able to do. Okay, can you move on? We're getting near I, the end, please. Yep, we will. Uh, we have here, we have good uh, proper grading of Goebbels Grove, uh, area where the sand is above the water table, and down here, it's where it was below. I believe that this happened many years ago when there was some grading that was going on and it was stopped, and it brought the water table above where the sand area was. There is a great divide between the two areas. We actually have the graded area here, and we have the non-graded area here. 
So we'll see that there is a difference. There is an imbalance that happens at Global's Grove. Um, the naturalization process has actually moved forward and it's, a little, it's out of control at this point. So it's now swampy grass, as I've seen. Once again, we have the beach area maintained 40%. Something has to happen with this area here. Decision has to be made. What am I asking council for? I'm asking for a commitment from Sogging Shores to try to restore the beautiful beach at Goebbels Grove. I'm asking for the same standard of care for all of Goebbels Grove Beach area as for the other beaches in the area. And I'm asking for a timeline and an action plan. We have a responsibility of management and stewardship for Goebbels Grove, not just to allow free growth of grasses for dune retention. With this management, there will be a balance that will retain the dunes and also address the need to attract tourists rather than to re repel them from Port Elgin. Goebbels Grove can once again become a beautiful beach, the town's greatest asset. Thank you for the opportunity for presenting this slideshow. Thank you, Jeff. Questions or comments for Mr. Page? Councillor Mike Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Thank you, Jeff, for the presentation. Um, one of the one of the questions I asked Pamela earlier was uh, about balancing environmental and social economic uh, interests of our community, and I, I think, Mr. Mayor, that we, uh, you know, there is. I, I really do believe there is there is a common ground here with uh, with taking you know taking a serious look at what what's happening in in certain areas of our community, particularly in this case tonight. Jeff speaking to is uh, is, is Global Grove Beach, but I just I wanted to refer to something, if I might, and that's our beach grooming policy from 2007. And this was prepared by our director of uh, uh, public works, Bill Jones, approved by council. And that section of beach, in fact, is an area that uh, back in 2007 was clearly marked that, 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 that should be maintained between the washing out to the point. It is about 400 meters. I'm not, I don't, I don't know whether I'm convinced that we need to go the full 400 meters or not. Uh, that, that would need to be discussed. But I, I really do think that uh, we, we need to take a serious look at that area between the beach house and, 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 and moving down, oh, whether it's 100 meters, 200 meters, whatever it is. But, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to take a look at placing a volleyball court back down at that end again, uh, bringing some more people down from uh, Ferndale Lane and, and Bell Road and, and people that front along that area won't want to see the beach brought back. And, and I, I, I know there has to be a balance, I get that. And I have utmost respect for, for coastal preservation and, and through, uh, through our, you know, Jeff Peach and our presenter this evening. And I, I you know, I, I, under, I understand where they stand with stewardship and I, I understand stewardship as well. I, I just think there needs to be a, a balance. And I, I guess, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, to, to our, our Director of Public Works, um, Stuart, could you answer for me uh, there was there was a map showing up on the um, on the screen here this evening about one of the comments was made about dra about about dragging procedures grading procedures and and, and it shows some so we're dragging over the years has created uh, wet areas on the beach could you can you just put you on the spot here Stuart could you make comment on 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 our dragging procedures over the year and has it been fixed I understand that maybe was a remedy made this year but. Um, is there something that has gone on to, to speak to that one slide? Sure. Um, if, if I may, Mr. Um, so uh, you're correct uh, that that policy does refer us to, to grade down there. Now, for many years now, we haven't graded that area due to some requests from the, from the local individuals that didn't want us grading down there. Um, there is another, I think, item on this evening's agenda regarding this, the grading down in that area. So. You know, certainly if council directs us to revisit that and go back to that, that policy that we've, we have in place right now, I don't think there's an issue there for us to do that. Um, we do have the resources to go ahead and do that. Now, this slide, I, 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 yeah, I probably won't comment on that, but, you know, no, us not grading the beach doesn't result in the water coming up. You know, that, that's certainly due to sand formation, the way things are sitting the way they are right now. We have that issue with the, the low water levels, the grass is moving out. Now the high water levels, things have come together a lot faster than, than they normally would. And that would be one of the main reasons for the narrower beach than we've seen in the past. So even if we didn't do the grading previous years, it wouldn't have this type of impact. Now, 
past practice. We haven't been down, down there and graded that section of beach for some time. This year we did not change that practice. We, we put our efforts on the main beach. Again, if council directs us to go further south, then that's certainly something that we can offer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just put one last comment. I, I just, I think we've done uh, back into 2006, 7, 8, 9. I, and some people may, maybe disagree with the statement, but I, I for one think that the town has put, done a pretty good job with planting dune grasses down at the Port Ogden Beach. Not everybody agrees with them. I recall days when we used to sweep that promenade down there five times a week, and now we don't have to pretty much don't have to sweep the promenade because the, you know, the sand is being stopped up on the Port Ogden Beach. And I, so I think we've I think we've made some good strides, and I think. I think there's room for common ground with south of the Washington facility. We talked about the planning of uh, good grasses, doing grasses, and perhaps a plan uh, some, you know, can be put together through, through a staff report uh, through our director of public works and Jane where, you know, my recommendation would, Mr. Mayor, was that we come back with a report talking about what area that we, we may as a council consider. Uh, putting maintenance back into that area south of the washing facility. What could we do with planting some, some, uh, some dune grasses to to assist with, with sand migration? If if lake levels do drop again, we get sand migration back back into that area. Uh, you know, I, so I'm just wondering, Mr. Mayor, if we could call upon staff to, uh, to bring back a report to talk about the 2007 um, policy that we have for for maintaining that area. Talk about dune grass plantings. Talk about a middle ground. Um, you know, something with a balance so we can deal with this, you know, environmental, social, and economic uh, impact. So that would be my request, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think we can make, and I think, again, I'll go back to Neil's original question. There were a number of those things were addressed in the waterfront plan about developing policies about dune grass, and I think as we go forward with that and implement that, we'll get uh, a better understanding of where, what the community wants. I know you will never get agreement on what the community wants on the beach. There's always controversy there, but I think we, for generally we can come up with a policy that will sort of satisfy most people. Mate. Thanks. Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Jeff, for the, uh, for the presentation this evening and for coming in and, and for presenting some ideas to us for how to address this. And it's just important to note, and, and it has been raised already this evening, and I think this, this report that uh, we've just talked about is really already coming. It's this beach maintenance policy that we're expecting here in the next couple of weeks, it's all, there's a uh, information report on tonight's agenda from the Director of Community Services about it. Uh, and I think, I really think that that, in the end, is going to be the way to address this, because it's interesting, the dialogue we just heard, the Director of Public Works, uh, you know, we have this, we have uh, this policy from 2007, uh, the Director of Public Works attempting to work with the neighborhood, uh, moved away from from that uh, policy over the last couple of years, you know, working, always trying to work with, with people, trying to, trying to figure out a way that, that best suits what the neighborhood wants for the beach and what's the best interest of the municipality uh, and, and the general public in terms of how the beaches operate. Uh, but it leads us to sort of going back and forth, you know, into different policies here, different policies there, always sort of responding to which way the wind is blowing or which way the sand is moving. Uh, and, and what we need, what we really need is a policy, uh, a comprehensive policy uh, covering the waterfront from uh, the north end of Southampton to the south end of Saugeen Township and everywhere in between and, 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 and coming up with good solutions and, and, and the, the chink in that armor, the difficulty in doing that is that they need to be permanent solutions or solutions which can stand the test of time, which aren't, don't get pushed back and forth by the by whether the lake is high this year or low next year or whether we have this issue or that issue we need to have flexible policies in that flexible guidelines in that policy that can respond and meet the needs both economic social and environmental on an ongoing basis and what that's going to require is working with people like the Lake Huron Coastal Conservation uh, consulting with uh, stakeholder groups across the community and coming up with some strong policies but it's also going to require us all to compromise and to enter those discussions with a with the spirit of compromise and and understand that some years if if you draw that line in the sand, pardon the pun, as to this is where we're gonna grade and this isn't where we're gonna grade, or this is the part of the beach we're gonna maintain and this is the part we're not gonna maintain for these reasons, and we all agree on that as part of a policy, then we all need as a community to stand behind that that policy. We all need to say this is the policy. And so if the lake comes up and, and wipes the beach out one year, we have to say, you know, that's not good and we don't have the beach to enjoy here this year. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, 
that's a problem for a lot of reasons, but we have this good policy, this long-term policy that's got some good background to it, and at one time we all agreed to it, and we got to stick to it. Oh, and, yeah. and, and so, I, so all I'm saying is, and, I, and I, like I say, I appreciate everything you, you're saying, and, and I think we can incorporate some of those ideas into the policy. Uh, but I just really wanted to make that comment that uh, hopefully we can all work together and we can compromise a bit and we can come up with something that's long-standing and it's going to work uh, and so that we don't have to have uh, the ongoing back and forth changing our policy year in, year out to, to, to uh, accommodate however high the lake happens to be this year or, or whatever the issue is this year, right? Um, so I look forward to the report from, from Community Services. And once again, I want to thank you for being here tonight, Jeff. Thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Page, and thanks, Council. And that's the end of our deputations then. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a general government staff report and it has to do with the implementation of a council visioning session, project priorities, and our CAO will present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council budgeted to undertake a visioning and priority setting session early in its term. Two such sessions were held, one in January and one in April of this year. The sessions were facilitated by a professional in, at, at a, that helped council in that regard. Included on the agenda were sessions related to priority setting for the upcoming term and beyond, council staff interactions, communications with the public, committee structure, and the procedural bylaw. Council received the summary from the second session in May that it included a rank project priority list containing the 10 highest scoring potential projects from both a capital infrastructure perspective and a study and report perspective. And the complete list is attached as an appendix to the report. Also included in the report are the notes that the facilitator made with respect to the next steps to be undertaken by staff. So in accordance with that direction attached to the report are two tables which uh, hope to fulfill the objectives that are noted. Senior staff have reviewed the priority list and provided a complete explanation outlining their understanding of what these particular projects would entail. The description provided is modeled after one which would be provided as the rationale on a capital budget detail sheet. The additional information on the table includes commentary related to whether it is currently in the five-year forecast, whether the timing is proposed to shift as a result of its individual priority score, and where in the future forecast it might be slotted if it is a new project that would be added. Where possible, high-level costing information and impacts related to staff resources are also identified. This supplements the recent mid-year capital program report that Council received that outlined the status of partially completed projects. Staff understands that the next steps involve a council review of the additional information provided and the identification of those items requiring further priority attention from the list. So the, the broad implications from the financial impact perspective are included in the, each of the categories on the tables and can be considered individually as projects are identified for consideration. Input from council at this stage will assist staff with the preparation of the draft 2016 budget and future year's forecast which is getting underway at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Larry. Then the recommendation is that the attached table outlining additional information related to the implementation of Council's project priorities for 2014-2018 term be received, that Council identify any key projects for which further emphasis is required to occur in the short term. Comments? Councillor Mike Mayett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what, what, in the recommendation, our CAO has mentioned the council identify any key projects for which further emphasis is required to occur in the short term. And what, what, I guess the project that I, you know, they, they, and it's a significant project. We're talking uh, a lot of dollars to move this project forward. It's in our top ten from our visioning statement. Um, if you take a look at our top ten, and I'm going to zero in on one, one, one I, I believe is extremely important to this community. We've heard some discussions about it this evening is our waterfront development. Um, at our last uh, waterfront um, advisory committee meeting, Mr. Mayor, uh, there was discussion around the table about pro uh, what, what, what project or projects would, would um, be uh, best suited to, to move forward through our director of community services and through the council to move forward as a capital initiative for 2016. And um, <clears throat> there was a motion passed uh, at our most recent um, Waterfront Advisory Committee meeting that the that um, Port Algon Waterfront um, be prioritized, uh, moved up to the top of the list in terms of being a high priority uh, for discussion at, at Council's um, capital deliberations in November. 
um, that motion was passed unanimously and, and, and at the uh, Recreation Advisory, uh, pardon me, at the Waterfront Advisory Committee meeting, uh, there was talk about a, talk about a hybrid um, uh, program, capital project, talking about the entranceway to the Port Algon Waterfront, talking about the washroom facility, uh, potentially talking about, uh, you know, some, some active playground areas in that vicinity as well. And we know what our drainage situation is like down at the Port Augen uh, waterfront. And uh, sometimes you drive through the park a lot and it, and it gets uh, a little bit to roly, roly poly down there. And, and that's just, it becomes a drainage issue. There's some, there are obviously some concerns, some concerns down there. So my, my suggestion, recommendation, I suppose, this evening uh, to do with the waterfront, I, 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 I think that I pulled out through our treasurer some numbers in 2015. Um, Ninety-seven thousand dollars of our eleven point two million dollar um, tax levy um, amount was spent on water from Mr. Mayor, which is about you know a little over three quarters of one percent. And on capital, uh, this past year we spent less than one quarter of one percent um, on, on on capital projects from from our capital initiatives and from tax levy. So, uh, you know, we we've got such an important. Um, um, facility down there, a director of community service refers to as our flagship beach, I agree with that. And I think it's time that we uh, do step forward and, and invest uh, once and for all in our in our Port Algon waterfront and move that waterfront master plan forward. And um, so just in response to the recommendation where our CIO is looking for any key projects uh, required to occur in the short term, the water moving forward with the waterfront master plan in 2016, Mr. Mayor, would be something that I would like to suggest that this council have have discussion about and uh, the minutes from the waterfront advisory committee will be here in two weeks and that recommendation is contained within those minutes so that, that'd be my recommendation mr. Mayor. thanks Mike and I'm sure those discussions when we get into those budget deliberations will be high on a number of people's agenda and it will be discussed deputy mayor Sherman thank you mr. mayor um, and of course I certainly agree with uh, everything councilor Maya just said I, I just wonder about in terms of talking about this general discussion around this whole um, matrix. It's going to be virtually impossible for us in this moment going around the table identifying key projects to the CIO to sort of come up with anything really comprehensible at the end. I wonder if the better way to approach this whole thing is to look at it in terms of um, this as the budget priorities uh, come forward we there are going to be downtown streetscape projects, I guarantee it, they're going to come from our BIAs. There are going to be waterfront projects, I guarantee it, because the water, because Mike's just told us the waterfront committee is going to generate them. A lot of the projects that we want to see, that our council's priorities, are being generated by the committees we struck, which is why we struck them. Uh, and so I think that we should use this matrix as it is to uh, sort and rank uh, projects as they come forward in the capital budget. Uh, and so, so a project that falls into one of these categories that's of importance to council would receive, would would rank would float to the top of the budget process, uh, and we, we already have tacit agreement on that, or at least we could we could come close to it that way. I just don't think that we can go through uh, and start identifying projects because we're all going to have different project priorities here at this moment, and I think that's going to be difficult a difficult way to address this. I think we could take. The projects as they come forward and use this great document to to rank the, the, the budget uh, capital projects and some operational projects and and then that'll help us make decisions uh, come budget time I, I think that might work better thank you Mr. Mayor. yeah I think and I think just to clarify I, I don't think the intent with this report was that we were going to go and reprioritize all of these items I think the idea was that these are what we found and uh, as we go forward, because they're all going to be budget items. That, at, 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 and I agree with your your analysis about when we get recommendations for those particular committees that we have struck, that we will consider those at budget time. Because I don't suspect that this is going to lead to a major change in our budget halfway through the year. No, okay. You sure. Thank you, Mr. Herr. I think essentially that's what's been done here. As we describe the top ten capital items, there's a couple that I said were basically underway now. There's a couple that I, I tried to suggest through input from the from the directors that we don't require, perhaps with the same degree of um, ranking that the council had them, so they're going to get pushed out in the forecast a bit. So I, I think you'll see those that you naturally want to see as part of the capital budget process. So I just want to make sure we had that interpretation correct. Yeah. 
Thanks, Larry. That clarification, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I applaud the, the energy and the enthusiasm that went into this. I, I, I don't see this yet as us having any kind of vision or strategy. Um, so I hope that, you know, as we work our way through this, we, we get a little greater sense of, of priorities and, and just, you know, planning. Um, I, I, again, applaud the energy here and, and in terms of what Councillor Myatt said about the waterfront, as a member of the Ad Hoc Waterfront Committee, what we decided was to create along the shoreline a number of destinations and they all had sort of a different focus and um, so um, it just makes sense that, you know, as the committee comes into play that, that the priorities within the destination shop, I agree with that. What I don't um, understand about all of this though is that we have unfinished business too, that um, we keep adding more to the plate. And I guess, you know, I'm looking back, it's my third term on council. We've started so many things that we haven't finished yet. And um, we can't just keep adding to the list regularly. You know, we did a signage strategy. Um, we still don't have the gateway signs in Port Elgin. Um, the only reason we have uh, refurbished ones in Southampton is because one of the service groups stepped up to the plate and tossed a little bit of cash into the table. We never finished that project. We, we started something with the Southampton Town Hall. We've never finished that project. We've started other things. We've never finished them. So um, just as we keep going with this process, it's great that, you know, there's, there's this um, initiative to come up with, with a matrix and, and put some things in a, in a ranking and, and, you know, get some committees putting some things into the, the budget deliberations. But um, at some point, I, I would really appreciate if we saw stuff that we started that we just haven't finished. And uh, we make a decision not to finish it or we finish some of those things. Um, so I, I look forward to all of this working its way through this, this uh, term of council, hopefully over the next year, that we, we put it all in, in a, a bit of a plan that we realize some completions and we get a few things started that um, they're going to take about 10 years to finish as well. Um, we can't do everything instantly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those comments. If any other questions? If not, then all in favor of the recommendation. Opposed, if any, that is carried. So the next item on the agenda is a staff report with the proposed partnership agreement transition with the Saugeen Shores Business Enterprise Center. And again, our CAO, Larry Allison, will present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In April 2014, Council approved the execution of an agreement with the province that governs the core range of services provided by the Saugeen Shores Business Enterprise Center. The agreement is for a three-year term expiring in April 2017. Staff indicated at the time the agreement was a new funding model put in place by the Ministry that provides grant funds up front and allows more autonomy in the operation of the BEC, provided certain minimum standards were met. The core funding agreement was supplemented by additional documents dealing in a similar fashion with the successful starter company program and the summer company program that we have undertaken historically. So taken together, these three documents dictate the relationship between the ministry and the town for the programs and services the BEC provides to the community and also to the broader county of Bruce. The centre has operated successfully in Saugeen Shores for 15 years. It does provide vital support to aspiring summer students and entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting or growing a new business. Recent trends have indicated that both the direct clients of the centre and the participants in the range of programs offered throughout the county have increasingly been members of the broadie, broader Bruce County community. The vacancy in the manager's position that occurred earlier this year created an opportunity to examine the current role and operation of the centre. Coupled with that, the organizational review undertaken recently by the county resulted in a series of recommendations that centered on expansion of their economic development role and the provision of support to small business. Those factors led to discussions with senior county staff and the mutual conclusion that a transfer of responsibility for the centre to the upper tier might best serve the whole county business community over the longer term. After their internal consideration of our request, town staff have received confirmation that the county is prepared to discuss accepting responsibility for the centre's operation commencing next fiscal year if our council supports the transfer. The uh, centre advisor from the ministry is also supportive of the change in partnership and is available to work with the town and county to effect the transition, if approved, to pursue it. He has indicated that in his experience with similar migrations from the lower to upper tier, there are greater opportunities to enhance services to the clients. 
The ministry's legal staff have reviewed the agreements and are and are and advise they are willing to prepare the documentation necessary to effect the transfer of responsibility. Uh, staff is confident the core programs and services offered by the centre will be just as effective as they are today if the change is approved. The county has indicated a willingness to remain in our facility for the initial term of the new arrangement. Thus, the transfer will be seamless for clients that are currently receiving services. Moreover, there will be a greater future opportunity to enhance the range of services provided by the office with the county partnership than there would be if the service were continued to be administered locally. And there are some indications in the financial impact of the overall budget and the uh, subsidy we provide to the operation currently, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Larry. Then the recommendation is that staff be authorized to work with a county and ministry staff to effect a transition of the responsibility for programs and operations of the Sogging Shores Business Enterprise Centre to the County of Bruce, effective April 1st, 2016. Questions or comments? Let's start with Vice Deputy Mayor Hubert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just curious, um, through you to the CAO, um, we have municipal staff members who work in that area. Are they... Are they included in the transfer, or are we talking about um, downsizing? Great, Mr. Mayor, there is a there are two full time positions in our complement, one of which is vacant, and there is one contract person. So uh, the staff of the uh, center are assets to the community, as are the uh, software programs and the equipment that's in the office, all of which need to be discussed in some detail with the county. But I, based on what I understand, there's lots of opportunity there for migration. Councillor Grace. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, to follow up with that, uh, one of the comments in the financial impact is ultimately result in the reduction of two full-time staff complement positions at the local level. So um, could you explain exactly what that means? If the service were migrated to the upper tier, then the positions themselves would not be required at the lower tier. But would there be, um, this is going to what uh, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber was talking about, um, would there be an opportunity for those positions still to be available to those people at the upper tier? Or are we eliminating two positions? I know we're eliminating them at the lower level, lower tier, but are they still available at the upper tier? That's the conversation we will be having okay. as part of the transition. We're but, not sure. But, but there are, yeah, there's more than enough work for two people in the office. Okay. It just is ultimately results. It just means we're taking them out of our staff. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, obviously there's some discussions yet to be had, and I think this are, it has to be accomplished to our satisfaction uh, in the outset. But I think it's important to keep our eye on the ultimate benefits of this change. Uh, one, that this is all, this Sogging Shores Business Enterprise Center is already serving the entire county of Bruce. This, this moves the, the, it to really the level of government where it belongs. It will enable it to do the service that it's already providing well and probably allow it to expand and, and improve inside the context of what is a changing upper tier uh, uh, economic development uh, approach as well. And then the benefit at the lower tier at, in the town of Soggy and Shores is it frees up funding. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's hard to exactly come up with a number, but there's a rental issue and, and also the $38,000 subsidy that the town of Soggy and Shores pays annually. Uh, and what that can enable us to do is to start to do some of the things that we were advised to do by the business retention and expansion study a number of years ago, namely for the town of Soggy and Shores to begin to play the leadership role in economic development that it ought to be playing and should have been playing for a long time and that we've been trying to get it to do. Uh, and we can use that funding to help us move in that direction and play that cap piece role and coordinate and direct economic development in a way that, that that will serve us at the lower tier better. So we can get the, we can have both of these services happening. The Business Enterprise Center service is an important one in terms of coaching and mentoring uh, businesses to start in the community, and they've been very successful, and they're going to keep doing that. At the same time, the Town of Saugeen Shores can start to, uh, to coordinate higher level economic development in the Town of Saugeen Shores, uh, and that will bear dividends, I'm sure. Uh, so. Uh, so I think it's got a lot going for it. I'm going to support the recommendation. I'm looking forward to hearing more details about how it will be executed uh, to ensure that uh, some of the things we want to happen do happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Rich. 
Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor, I think it's just worth noting that I did go into the Business Enterprise Center and talk to the employees there, and they're very supportive of this move. So I think that that's a bit of information that I think all counselors can use. Thank you. Any Councillor Mike Matt. Really just a comment, Mr. Mayor, and uh, uh, kudos to our, uh, our CEO. I, I, I support this motion. I had a nice long chat with Larry about it, and, and I think with uploading this to the, uh, the county level, I think is a very uh, very smart move. There, there, are, there are some savings. I think there will be some potential rental space, and I, I think in our budget it, it, it's, it's a good news story. And, and the service is still going to be maintained. There's no fear there. And so I think it's just I agree with what our uh, Deputy Mayor said, uh, word for word, and I, I just think it's a real uh, smart business move. So thank you, Mr. Larry, for uh, your fine work on this one. Okay, no further comments then. All in favor of the recommendation. Opposed, if any, that's carried. I've been to request that we take a five minute break. The next item on the agenda is um, a planning and development staff report, and it has to do with the downtown Southampton facade guidelines and our Manager of Development Services, Bart Toby, will present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As part of Socking Shore's ongoing effort to initiate and support downtown revitalization programs, the town undertook to complete the facade guidelines for the town of downtown Southampton. Two public workshops were held in the summer of 2014 to solicit input on the facade guidelines and the street take plan presented at a later meeting. Workshops were held at the Southampton Town Hall. During the first workshop, participants participated in identifying the public spaces that could be enhanced and identifying types of build form and design details which could be used. The second workshop, our consultants worked towards refining options for facade improvements based on the input of the first workshop. Consultant presented the recommended, recommended streetscape plans and facade improvement guidelines in December of 2000 to Council. Following the public consultation and presentation to staff, sorry, excuse me. Following the public consultation and presentation, staff circulated the facade guidelines and streetscape plan to the BIA for additional feedback. The BIA responded on the facade guidelines is attached to this report. At this time, staff is recommending the guidelines to be endorsed by council. The guidelines, if adopted, will be used by the town, businesses, and landowners, landowners alike to assist in the rehabilitation and ongoing preservation of Southampton downtown commercial building facades, aid in the coordination and orderly rehabilitation of building facades within the downtown, promote the commercial revitalization of the downtown by encouraging facade upgrades that would continue to attract local residents and visitors. Should the town wish to continue with the with providing financial assistance to the business owners, the guidelines may be a tool used to support target facade improvement. Thanks, Bart. Uh, then uh, the recommendation is that council adopts the downtown Southampton commercial facade improvement guidelines. Questions, comments? Vice, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's, it's really just a, a, a question of, of clarification. Um, the, the report suggests that um, we're being asked to endorse something. Um, we get asked to receive reports, approve re reports, adopt reports. I, I guess um, it would be helpful, I think, at some point to have just some definitions of what all of, all of those words mean so that um, we, we start to use perhaps three or four of them consistently um, because uh, endorse means something, but is, is it different from adopt? Um, it's, it's one of the very few times I've seen endorse in a document. Thank you. Recommendation says adopts, but um, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, Diane, and I think we can ask the staff to, to come back with some in, what that intent means. It's easy. Yeah. Uh, Count, Councillor Gray, sorry. <laughs> My tongue tied. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, Bart, I do have a specific question uh, from the um, guidelines itself. Um, I noticed that most of the guidelines um, for the recommendations, uh, the suggestions are worded in a, in a way to say we, we're going to encourage, um, give incentives, things like that. However, on page 7, there's a quotation that, that seems more definitive that says, new buildings can use up-to-date material and technologies as long as the design maintains and enhances the visual continuity of the streetscape. To, I don't have a problem with this idea, but um, it seems 
almost like there would be um, a consequence or a repercussion if those new businesses didn't conform to that standard. And I'm just wondering uh, how that would be um, controlled. Uh, in last month's planning committee meeting, I actually asked um, Jay Posner a hypothetical. What happens if a store owner decides that they want to use some kind of garish design that doesn't fit in at all with the, um, you know, the guidelines. And he said, there's really nothing we can do about it. So I, I'm just, I, I'm wondering, um, that seems like a very definitive statement indicating that there will be consequences. And what's the, what's the, um, What's the plan there, I guess? I think uh, Larry can answer that for you, Mr. Joe. Through Mr. Mayor, uh, much of the downtown core in Southampton is subject to, to site plan control. And it is that process where council has a little bit of control over the appearance of the external facades of the structure. So if there was something that was going to kind of contrast dramatically with with the in spirit and the intent of what, what these are saying, I suspect that staff would be bringing it here early to have some input at this table before we kind of pursued a, an outright rejection of what a proponent was wanting to build and, and or, um, uh, you know, working with them to the point where the document was complete and, and then putting council kind of in a difficult spot to have something that may not fit with the community. I think we'd be looking for some political input early as to what council might deem to be acceptable. And if council supported the concept that it may not be compatible, then then the, the owner would have some recourse to the OMB and those kinds of things through site plan control. Because that was my next question. So how far, if you've got somebody who's, you know, determined that they want a bright pink and purple yep. building um, that looks very modern, um, we don't really have any teeth in here to, we to defend a ourselves in an OMB appeal. We have lots of encouragement in the document, and if it ever progressed to that stage, the fact that you have adopted the design guidelines, I think, stands, sends a pretty strong message to the board. But ultimately, it is out of council's hands. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sherbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Site plan control is the stick, but we talked for a minute about the carrot, and the, the carrot is, is our incentive programs, mainly at this moment, Spruce the Bruce. Uh, and uh, I'll remind Council that it also has the authority under the Southampton Community Improvement Plan to start its own incentive programs if it wanted to. And that, and, but that, ca that carrot of uh, the Spruce the Bruce program, what we've, what we've done here, and can I just say for the record, I'm, I'm thrilled to see one of these documents actually coming to Council for adoption. <laughs> and finally, we have one of these that we can actually adopt, and uh, it's great to see. And, but I... Uh, that what this will do is it plugs neatly into that process that's already in place with Spruce the Bruce and the CIP uh, to create a guideline created by the public around how we issue those grants uh, so that we so so we can say to proponents if you would like to access Spruce the Bruce and receive the matching grant money for your project here are some, here are the guidelines that are going to enable you to access that program that's the carrot that's how we that's how we encourage people in a proactive way to get them involved here uh, and 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 it's a, it's a critically important thing for us to do business by business downtown because uh, every uh, you can have a beautiful downtown, but if you have one or two derelict or rundown buildings or buildings that don't uh, don't match the the overall uh, brand or theme of the core, it can really detract from the core. And there's a, so there's a broader community interest, uh, economic interest in the municipality pursuing these uh, this carrot. Uh, incentive approach and, uh, and I'm glad Bruce County has done it and, and um, I've advocated gently in the past and perhaps more aggressively in the future that Soggy Shores should follow suit. Um, so, uh, so it's good to see this here. I'm, of course, I'm obviously going to vote in favor of it and I'm glad also to see the BI, Southampton BIA has uh, well, at least does not object to the uh, to the adoption of, of the document and uh, the, we, and, uh, we have to start 
working through on the other side with them on the streetscape side of this project as well. Uh, that it was sort of the mirror image of the facade guidelines uh, uh, and, uh, and hopefully get it to a place where we could be having the same sort of conversation about it as well. Uh, and I'll also just finally, Mr. Mayor, I want to comment on the other thing that's in the BIA's letter to us supporting it, and that is their support of the, uh, of the patio policy. Uh, that is the, we now have the endorsement of both BIAs on that subject, and I'm very eager and would like to make comment to staff that I'm very eager to see that policy make its way to council now. Uh, there are some restrictions in, that the, in the current policy which I think are unnecessarily restrictive on downtown business. And we now have a draft policy which eliminates them, and I think we should get it adopted. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So, any other comments? All in favor of the recommendation? That's carried. The next item on the agenda is communication for petitions of, uh, petitions for committee of the whole action. And we have a motion from the Saugeen, or the Port Elgin, sorry, Saugeen Shores Police Services Board about the HVAC system at the police building. And perhaps maybe the chair can speak to it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just very simply, uh, the Police Services Board uh, got a recommendation, or not a recommendation, pardon me, a report on the HVAC system. As Council is aware, the HVAC system in the Police Services Building is problematic and uh, not adequately servicing our employees uh, there, and it needs uh, repair. We got the report. My understanding, uh, and the CAO can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Council will also have the benefit of seeing that report sometime next month. Uh, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to discuss it then. This is just the Police Services Board asking Council to take action uh, once it sees that report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, then we'll wait till we see the report. So the next item on the agenda then is 5.8, communication for petitions of the committee whole for information. There's a number of items there. They're there for information only. Any questions for clarification on them? We'll start with uh, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a question about the minutes of the Waterfront Committee. Um, I'm noting the discussion about the use of Skype, um, and I haven't seen this particular um, point mentioned in other minutes uh, for our committees of this term, and I, I didn't notice it in the procedural bylaw, and I think if we're going to have this policy in one committee, it should be something we should be exploring if we want to do that across the board. Okay, yeah, I think we can direct that to the clerk. Um, <laughs> no, I'll get it, don't worry. <laughs> Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to make a couple comments uh, with regards to item number eight that's on the correspondence. And uh, although I'm not going to speak specifically to the the correspondence that comes from the Mr. and Mrs. Roberts who are in attendance here tonight. More generally, uh, I'd like to make some comments and in fact uh, I'd like to see some changes take place with regards to the way that we deal with encroachments in the town of Saugeen Shores. Uh, and specifically, um, our, our current policy appears to be very restrictive and, and very black and white when it comes to requests for encroachments on road allowances, town property, right-of-ways, or, or any any of the sort. And um, and I think uh, the way that's being administered uh, is, is by the letter of the rule, but uh, of the policy, and I think we need to revisit that policy because there are, there are existing encroachments that have been either done uh, last year or last decade or last century that uh, – are, are in existence, and uh, and there are some that are done more, re much more recently, and with people who have uh, simply not gone through the process of asking and being refused. So, the the way that it's been administered and the way it's currently being administered, I think is uh, is unfairly restrictive. And, and when when somebody brings forward a request for uh, encroachment or uh, the ability to do some landscaping or or change some uh, abutment property to that is, prop, is owned by the municipality, I think there needs to be something in that policy that allows for some interpretation and, and some rationale to be applied where it uh, where is, and, and covers the liability for the town and for the property owner. But where it makes sense and where the, where the resultant changes are, uh, are done in such a manner that uh, it enhances the the, uh, the look and the feel of the property 
and 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 the one this correspondence relates to uh, property that we're all uh, aware of, which is down on the North Shore Road. But there are many others in many other areas, uh, not just in the in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas, where uh, where people have desire to, or people have simply gone gone out and, and done changes. And and everybody likes to maintain their boulevard, and and uh, but when it comes to you know, making actual structural changes, or and I, I don't. I'm not talking about putting up structures or building sheds or shops on municipal property, because obviously that's not something that we want to get into. But I believe there are instances, and and there's room for some interpretation for people to be able to uh, make thing, make changes that make sense and that aren't going to degrade the property. That aren't going to, as long as they don't interfere with traffic flow or volume or, or things like that. So I. I, it's my intention to bring forward a motion at our next council meeting that will direct staff to come up with some recommendations as to how we might change that policy that that allows a little more flexibility and allows for more interpretation. And, uh, and I know that uh, I know that some councillors in the room feel the same way, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to get some support for that. Okay, thanks, Councillor Benaj. Um, I have three, and the first one I'd like to echo. The sentiment and and I certainly heard it tonight from the deputy mayor the spirit of compromise and uh, certainly on the encroachment on Fenty, 53 Fenton Drive uh, we were all taken aback I think at at um, the clear-cutting method that was take that took place and and staff certainly brought forward a, a, a strong position that said this is wrong and and it needs to be corrected and it's and I've, I sent photographs to everybody on council. I believe it was well corrected, and, and I, I know that other members of council believe that if we waver just a little bit, then everybody's going to come and want to do everything. We were some of us were fortunate to be at the um, AMO conference, and I took a study tour um, of the uh, a part of the Niagara uh, Parks Commission Parkway and they spoke to the very essence of what we're speaking to here tonight, and that is working with the public to beautify a very important parkway trail, a road trail, and, and uh, they do that. And I think we can ask staff, Mr. Mayor, if, if we can ask staff, and I agree with the comments made, for, for some policy change that says we're willing to put individual properties on that are municipal, the municipal piece of the property that's fronting a million dollar view like they have with Lake Huron, put them under some kind of site plan control, loosely spoken, I'm not talking about rigid, that says what's your plan and, and work from there. So I'm asking think, you if yeah. you'd... Well, I think you can. I think these are, items are here for information, and we're really getting into a discussion on the particular policy that needs to get on the agenda in the proper manner, Neil. So I think, okay, fine, that's fine. We can deal with that when it gets on the agenda. This, the next item, then. Oh, okay, so just asking, then, inside that letter is a request. So what are we doing with that request? That's the essence of what John Mann is saying to us. He's asking oh, hold on, Neil. I think there, there's another item on the agenda here, specifically in the information report. We dealt with that 53. We dealt, council dealt with that. And we're asking really what the request is to, to change that position. And um, so, I mean, let's not get into that discussion. It's hardly fair. These are here for information purposes. If you want it on the agenda, you know the procedural bylaw. You've done it many times of how to get it on the agenda. I'll move on. Thank you. I've got two others, but I, I see them both with requests for us to do major pieces of information. The David Suzuki Foundation, the Blue Dot Program, has 26 bullets asking And us. again, Neil, you can get those on the agenda, but... I don't want them on the agenda. Somebody else has brought that forward and said, you need to adopt this. Okay. If, if, if there is no support around the table, if there's not a mover and a seconder to get it on the agenda, then it doesn't get there. It doesn't get there by magic. It gets there through the procedural bylaw. We need to some rules of how we conduct the business of this corporation, and that's what the procedural bylaw is for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to highlight um, 
the notice of the open house and the public meeting related to some updates to the comprehensive zoning bylaw. Um, we don't always do a very good job of communicating, um, but certainly um, this is one of the opportunities where we go out there to the community and say, here's the zoning bylaw. Um, it's a good chance for people to come in, see, see where they are on the map, see what specifically relates to their properties. It'd be nice to see a lot of people out at this. Also, uh, at the same time that this, this sort of over um, all update to the comprehensive zoning bylaws going on. And certainly there's some information that's possible that shows um, some items that are being specifically updated and, and um, indicated for potential changes. There is another application before the Planning Advisory Committee that's happening at about the same time, which is uh, an application to change um, the rules for a particular type of property across the entire community. And um, there was a notice in the paper a couple of weeks ago, it's about flag-shaped properties, and there was um, some conf confusion, excuse me, about what was meant by that. Um, so uh, anybody who has a piece of property that's got sort of a skinny little side to it and then a rectangle at the top, that's flag-shaped or P-shaped. So there's an application before planning right now that would impact every single one of those properties, it doesn't matter if it's Port Elgin, Southampton, or in the township. And also with that application is... Um, a comment or an application to change um, one of the specific rules associated with waterfront properties that are in that, that flag-shaped or P-shaped um, category. Um, anybody who owns a piece of property in this town should be interested in, in what the zoning bylaw says about their property. So I would just like to just highlight that there's a couple of open houses coming up. It's a great opportunity to come in and just see where you are on the map and if you have questions, but particularly I just wanted to say out loud, if somebody in the community has a piece of property that's got a long skinny side and a rectangle at the top, it could potentially be um, considered a flag-shaped or a P-shaped property, and we have an application before planning that's um, asking for changes across the board to that category of property. So thank you for letting me say that, but um, it's one of the few times we have to talk about zoning with the whole community. Thank you. Councillor Mike Mayer. I'm a little reluctant to go into this too much. I understand the procedure, Mr. Mayor, and I, I just, I just want to throw in one comment. I do support what you're saying, Councillor Mayer. I think, I think there's room for, for us to perhaps open the discussion around that topic. Maybe this isn't the right way to discuss around correspondence. I, I think some of the discussion is healthy, but I, I, uh, I, I understand procedure. One question I had, Mr. Mayor, was around the, um, the two petitions and ones we dealt with through the Global's Grow petition. But again, I know we're not maybe supposed to discuss these in too much length, but it's merely a question to clarify. Uh, the petition, for example, from the Port Island waterfront, I mean, these people have gone to, you know, a, a fair amount of work with 50, 60, 70 signatures, and they've outlined some concerns they have about the Port Island waterfront. And I guess my question to you then, Mr. Mayor, is you know, we, we don't want long discussion about this, but what what is the procedure then um, with, with the communications, like a petition that's shown here, and they've got some comments, some concerns, how, how is it dealt with then? How, how, how do we deal with the petition that comes to us to council to review? Um, is, is it simply on there for us to read before the meeting and then staff staff deal with it? Or what, what it I guess I well, need to have clarified. Well, it's, it's, this is information that comes here, committee. If council, council responds by motions or individually, but, but council as a whole, if we were, are to respond to those, it responds by a motion. In a past motion, way. If you want to respond to each one of those things, bring a motion to it, get it on the agenda. We'll have the discussion. We can get some staff input onto it, and then we'll respond. That's how council responds to it. Appreciate it, Mr. Just for because future. I mean, we're just having discussion here, and like you've got a different opinion than I have on many of these things. How so, do we respond? So we Mr. respond Mayor, by motions. No, I, no, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I just so for future meetings, because I guess I'm I'm still learning as a new councillor too. But um, so for future meetings. If, if there's an item on here uh, for communications, what you're suggesting is that we, 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 can, we can place a motion on the floor this evening dealing with any of these pieces of correspondence and present as a motion at this meeting or next meeting? Check, you know, the procedure by law, if you want to put it on the motion for tonight, it would need support of all of council, but you can do it with a, a notice of motion. I think you've removed one in the past, so you know how to get that on the agenda. So that would be the way to do it, Mike. 
Okay, just yep. just clear. And, and so and so in that case, and I mean, and it's really in fairness to all the rest of the members that we're going to have a lengthy discussion and perhaps make a decision on this, a particular topic that that we all want to be well prepared and well briefed on, and it's okay. fairness to the rest of the members okay. and Mr. staff. Mr. Mayor, I understand. So just to clarify, that for that petition from Port Algonquin, for example, are they communicated with? When, when, a, when an organization, an individual sends in a petition, do they, are they responded to in some format or uh, how does that work? Yes. Mr. Mayor, yes, they are through the clerk's office. Deputy Mayor. Just to add uh, to what the mayor said on that subject, the important thing to know, know about all these communications is that uh, you don't have to take action on them necessarily for them to impact the decision-making of council. We have, like I said, we have a policy coming forward in a couple of weeks uh, on this, on beach maintenance. We have received these petitions. They will influence our decision-making because we've seen them. I think that this, that's, that's what these communications are about. They, they, you, know, you don't have to take action. You don't have to do something about this petition because we're doing broader things. That, and this is, this is the intention of the petition is to influence, influence us to make particular decisions. And we're able to do that because we have policy is coming forward and we'll remember this petition when we make those decisions. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Madison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to speak very briefly about number four. Um, I'd like to congratulate our Director of Community Services for the application she put in for the rehabilitation of Ferry Lake for the Canada 150th Community Infrastructure Program. Um, we all know that Ferry Lake needs a little bit of work done to it and this money will go a long way when we match it and I look forward to the plans that will be coming forward to doing that. Thanks Councillor Matt. Any further questions or comments? Then we will move on to reports of the department head, and we have an information report on 53 Fenton Dive Drive. And our director, if there's any questions, the report is there. Any questions of Stuart on that report? I think we've had a fairly lengthy discussion already about it, but go ahead if there's any more. Thank you, sir. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make the, the comment for clarification because it isn't in here. Council is aware, but it's important to make it uh, for the public's knowledge that. that um, the staff, the report states that uh, there was no direction forthcoming from council on the stairs, but, but indeed there was on April 27th, council gave direction uh, supporting staff's position uh, on the stairs and directing staff to uh, resend the, uh, the correspondence that had been sent before. So council has taken, has taken a decision on the matter uh, and it was ratified by council on April 27th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, further comments? And the next item is an information report. It has to do with beach maintenance policy, and I, I don't know, Jane, if you want to speak to it. Any questions of Jane? Uh, Councillor Minaj. I would ask Mr. Mayor to, uh, to tell us the timeline then. Uh, I believe it's gone out for uh, some, some provincial agencies to review, some, maybe some county agencies to review, it's going to go to um, the Waterfront Advisory Committee for review. Uh, it's a draft document. At what point do the members of council get to review it? It's a fairly substantial document, um, and we have received correspondence back from one of the agencies and are anticipating correspondence back for the second one. Um, and as soon as we get that, then we'll subsequently send other agencies that we indicated that uh, being the beach maintenance waterfront advisory once I get it back from um, more that I'm waiting for a comment for I'll send it back Councillor Mike Matt to you Mr. Mayor to Jane Jane uh, can I, may I make the assumption that the comments made from the presentation this evening about Goebbels Grove uh, Beach House southward to 300 meters is going to be, there will be some mention in the beach maintenance standards about that section? Correct. Correct. Okay, go ahead one more, or we're going to need a motion to continue. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, through you to the Director of Community Services, um, so at that time that you then present it to the different associations, we will be receiving a copy of that at the same time? Of their comments are you referring to 
of the plan. Once I get a copy from them, you certainly will, and I want to be able to share it to the associations that obviously are key stakeholders and the Waterfront Advisory Committee. Once they have reviewed it, then Council will see it. Wouldn't it be prudent for us to get it at the same time as once you get it back from the ministry for us to get it, to be able to view it at the same time as the other uh, stakeholders? If that's Council's wishes, I can certainly do that. Sure, I think that's what we'll do. Okay. Apologies, I meant to ask this question. And uh, uh, the, the question I had presented to me today by one of the local groups, Jane, was approximately how much time would they have to review the plan? Would they have two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? How long would, would an association, for example, the Port Algon Beach Association, if they got a copy, how long will they have to report back? Maybe I missed that. Did I? Um, the one association got it back to me relatively quickly. I suspect if I haven't heard anything back from the other association within the next couple of days, I'll be contacting them. Oh, Port Algon Beach Association haven't received it yet. Oh, I thought you were referring to the uh, Lake Huron Coastal oh, no, no. Conservation. I meant, uh, once, once the port, like a group like the Port Ogden Beaches Association, for example, receives the plan, right? How much time will you allow them to review the plan? A week, two weeks. Two weeks. I know you're anxious to get it yourself, so certainly we want two weeks. to progress uh, that. This or, uh, the conversation I had one of the members today wanted wanted two months, but I said, well, I don't think it's going to be two months. But uh, you're thinking a couple weeks. I'd like that, yeah. That's the end of our agenda, and we're past our deadline, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Madison and the Deputy Mayor, all in favour, we're adjourned.